Hello everyone. So today we have Navneet from SBI Mutual Funds. We have been running this series called COVID-19 to Wealth 20 very successfully. First of all, I would like to thank the audience for such a wonderful response that we have got over the last 45 days of these informed sessions. In, in one minute, I would just like to explain, we are a new age investment services company. We have been doing two things really well. One is the wealth management and second is helping investors take informed investment decisions and doing these webinars during such unprecedented times is a step in that direction where we are helping investors make informed investment decisions. Today we have uh, Mr. Neeraj Shah, who is the moderator, uh, who is the chief editor from Bloomberg. He and Navneet would do an insightful session. Over to you guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kamal. And of course, I, I look forward to seeing you come in a bit later on and do the Q&A along with uh, Navneet as well. It'd be really nice to answer some questions from that audience would have as well. So look forward to that too. Uh, I think we'll do that in about 20, 25 minutes. So that's uh, a small thing. But Navneet, good having you. Uh, good talking to you. It's been a while. Uh, thanks so much. Um, what's your sense, Navneet? Is the smile um, a sign of the confidence that you have around maybe the liquidity situation around the world being benign and taking care of issues? Or do you fear that uh, sooner rather than later, the real economy issues could come and uh, dog the markets? So regardless of the environment, Neeraj, it always helps to keep you smiling. <laughs> That's true. On a more serious note, I think globally, clearly, the public discourse seems to be moving from survival only to revival also. Yeah. And I think initially, several governments, particularly at our end in India, uh, we focused a lot on stringency of the lockdown and then, of course, supplemented it with the uh, stimulus to contain the economic damage. But over a period of time, we are seeing in most of the other parts of the world and in India also, how do we come back to normalcy? How do we learn to live with it? Because nobody really knows how much time it will take for the world to really find a vaccine or a medication. Uh, though we are positive on antibody tests, but we have to see the efficacy and, and how they can be used. Till such time, I think we'll have to learn to live with it. And clearly, I think we are seeing across the world, public discourse clearly moving uh, in, in, in that direction. And I always give this analogy of air travel and road travel, where initially a lot of risk were there, uh, with the flights as well as the uh, automobiles on the road over a period of time both in terms of infrastructure the license to drive or license to fly and then all the other measures have reduced the risk and i think something similar is likely to happen all we need to do is i think how do we take care of people who are old and vulnerable i think the society can find a good so solution to that and provide a safety net to them then maybe rest of the economy and younger people can come back to work and i think that's why Maybe over the last couple of weeks, we are seeing markets, I think, uh, trying to see uh, some bottom that maybe over a period of time, we are going to learn to live with it. Apart from the huge stimulus that has been provided by the uh, uh, global policymakers. So, uh, you know, I just want to understand from you, Namit, when you decide to either put in money or try to asset allocate, because you are the largest money bag in the country currently, what takes center stage? Is it the global factors, the US-China spat and the liquidity thereof? Or do you reckon that what India is doing, trying to do and missing out on doing takes center stage right now? So I, I think a mix of all of those things. Uh, of course, I mean, just before this crisis, go back in the month of February, we were looking at a bottoming of the economy, a revival driven by the rural economy, some of the other measures taken by the government, particularly on the taxation side, on corporate tax side, how FDI flows can go up, so on and so forth. And suddenly this risk came completely unexpected, unprecedented. And then we have seen a massive a response from the global policymakers, which has also impacted all the markets, including the Indian markets, and of course the uh, reaction or, or the response from our policymakers. So all of those things impact the asset markets globally, including our markets. This year, interestingly, we have seen one of the biggest selling, uh, if I go back in history, uh, by the foreign institutional investors, both in the equity and debt markets. So of course the global markets impact us. Uh, as much. But over a period of time, from our perspective, though the asset allocation decisions are broadly done by our investors, but the way we manage our equity and bond funds, so on the equity side, we are a lot more uh, bottom-up investors, and on the bond side, have been bullish on the duration, uh, have been cautious on the credit, and we can discuss more of that in, in, in detail. 
present ourselves as the next big investment destination given our domestic demand our demographics our labor pool supply over the next several decades so on and so forth i think it could be an opportunity also for india so i'm sure in the very near term a uh, rising geopolitical risk will keep the uh, risk on sentiment and the pressure but on the other side from a medium to long term perspective if the policy response is right then it could be an opportune moment for india mm. difficult to say what would the right policy response be as well now need right now right so therefore my question is when i mean what is it that you are doing when you are making these decisions i think that's the crux of the question because a lot of people that we speak to are saying that there is no point in trying to figure out the damage in quarter 1 quarter 2 quarter 3 let's write off fy21 completely let's look at normalize fy22 earnings and then plan ascribe valuations is that the right approach if not are you doing a mix of something else can you speak a bit about that no you are absolutely right it's very difficult to predict how the growth is going to pan out how the overall situation going to pan out over the next 6 months or even 12 months or maybe we don't know 18 months as of now there is considerable uncertainty on the on the front of health crisis uh, the effectiveness of the stimulus which has been uh, given so far uncertainty on the economic growth front and uncertainty even on the longer term implications of this crisis how consumers policy makers businesses going to react to what we have seen in last two or three months now uh, looking at all of that it's better to focus on a longer term picture i mean look at individual companies and that's what i mentioned in the beginning focus has to be on a bottom up perspective look at individual companies uh take the worst possible scenario over the next uh, couple of quarters and see whether the company has got the liquidity the ability on the balance sheet ability to raise capital if need be or raise liquidity if need be and they have the they 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 not only survive this crisis but really invest really put those efforts in place where they can actually thrive over a longer period of time and bet on those names okay I mean, I, I'll get to that piece as well. Just wondering, what do you? I mean, when when you you obviously investing, uh, taking a bit of tactical calls as well, right? I'm I'm guessing when you're looking to invest uh, money versus maybe sitting a bit on cash or trying to be in defensives. What's your larger call? Do you think that the globe will stay safe because economies are opening up and there is liquidity, or do you think global markets too, particularly the US, which has had such a amazing run in the last one month, could yeah. come off a bit? What's your sense? Do you have a sense there? So interestingly, I mean, India has really underperformed uh, meaningfully yeah. over the last few months. I mean, U.S. markets are close to their all-time peak, despite the fact that whether you look at the health crisis or the impact on the economy or the unemployment data which has been coming out, all the other high-frequency data that have been coming out, clearly, I mean, there is a deep economic damage. But given the composition of the market, where a large part of the market is those technology companies, media and entertainment, and some of the sectors which are less impacted by By this crisis, in fact, some of them are positively impacted by this crisis. I think that has clearly helped, and the amount of stimulus is absolutely unprecedented. What the U.S. Federal Reserve is doing, and the comment by Janet Yellen last week that Fed should not shy away even from buying equities if need be, and the amount of fiscal stimulus that they have thrown, I think, has surely supported their asset markets. Now, at our end, I think the overall stimulus is of not that magnitude. Bulk of the heavy lifting has been done by the monetary policy. We may have to do a lot more on demand stimulus while government has tried its best to give a combination of uh, how to give a multiplier effect by those guarantees etc to the monetary stimulus as well as i think some good path on some of the structural reforms particularly on the side of agriculture uh, public sector on on state level reforms etc i hope that uh, we continue to do both of them a lot more demand stimulus as well as uh, remaining on the path of structural reforms Okay, just one last question, Amit, on this uh, global versus India in the relative case. 
would it happen that the US markets, because of the stimulus and the balance sheet, et cetera, et cetera, do well for the better part of the current year, but EMs at large and India in particular underperform or trend? Would that happen? So over the last 10 years, uh, US markets have significantly outperformed emerging markets, including uh, India, if yes. you look at in, in the dollar terms. Uh, whether that can continue over the next 10 years, I think if I look at the growth versus the valuations today, I think emerging markets clearly present a good opportunity. In the very near term, given the stimulus and the response which has come in US, and as I mentioned about the composition of that market where financials are a much lower part of the market. Again, the commodities companies, which uh, particularly within the emerging uh, market context has a larger weight, which have got negatively impacted by the commodity prices fall, may get impacted. But if I look at the next 10 years, I think in terms of whether the demographics or the demand potential, and also an indirect beneficiary of the overall stimulus in the world, even by the developed markets, I would bet the money on emerging markets over the next 10 years. Uh, despite the fact that last 10 years they have underperformed. And within that India, I think it's, it's really puzzling that uh, over the last few months, I mean, the way India has underperformed, not only the global markets, but even the emerging market peers, notwithstanding the fact that we are a commodity importer, we should have been a beneficiary of that. We are a lot more domestic demand driven economy rather than dependent on the global demand or the global trade. But maybe I think we, that, that's a clear signal that why foreigners are voting with their feet. I think it's a message that we need to do a lot more uh, from a policy response perspective to get foreign investors uh, back, in the, uh, back in our markets. Okay. How do you defend the argument of the valuations that India would be at? I mean, with the presumption that you are bullish, um, 18, 19 times trailing earnings in a scenario like this, is this acceptable because um, of, uh, I mean, relative to the other markets? You know, the statistical concept of mean is always... <laughs> ah, yeah, sure. Uh, okay. uh, I mean, we, we shouldn't pay too much attention to that because that 18 times hides a lot of things. I mean, there is clear so much of polarization in the market. I think the broader markets peaked, I think, sometime in December 18, early 19. Uh, December, uh, uh, yeah, the early part of 2018. And you look from, I think you go back and, and see the market direction from that. If mm -hmm. you remove the top 15 companies, then markets are substantially lower than where they are today. And the yeah. top 15 companies are closer to the all time high. And if you look at the mid cap 100 index, the top 15 companies are close to all time high versus the remaining 85 companies are like 35, 40% lower than where we were two years back. Uh, so clearly, I mean, there is huge polarization in the market. Now, this crisis has only accentuated that polarization. Now, if I have to invest from a three to five year perspective, not necessarily that you should bet only on those 15, 20 names. But of course, one thing you have to keep in mind is that who has the ability to survive this crisis because there is so much of uncertainty uh, ahead of us, but on, on this crisis. So, Nani, uh, would you dwell a bit upon? I mean, how would you how would you like to structure this now? Would you want to talk about what asset classes look poised for better gains, or within equities, what looks better, what doesn't look better? No, sure. Um, so let, 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 let's talk about whether equity or bonds. Maybe on the bond side. So clear view is that looking at the global environment, looking at the growth inflation dynamics, where RPI mentioned that we are going to have a degrowth first time in our history. Now, if you go back and see our history, uh, the earlier cycles, the 10 year bond yield bottomed at 5% or even below that in January 2009, or you go back to 2003-04. We are more closer to 6% today. Both the term premiums as well as the credit spreads are substantially higher. Given the uncertainty on the economic front, one would be cautious on the credit side would like to play it through the duration, maybe in the near term, we just consolidate the gains that have been made. But I think structurally, uh, rates should be lower than where they are today. And that's how you would play that. At some point in time in this year, I think given the steep yield curve and the very high credit spreads, at some point in time, even credit markets would become very, very attractive. This is not a war. The assets have mm -hmm. not, are, are, are not getting completely demolished. I mean, you have 
those assets and at some point in time they will be valuable again so if you can put the right collateral right covenants in place i'm sure credit markets will also throw interesting opportunity may not be in the form of a t plus one liability credit risk fund but maybe in an ai format a special situation or a stress that fund could be very very interesting coming to equities i think i'll go back to the same point that one has to be completely bottom up you have to really look at individual companies and see whether they have the ability to survive this crisis and taking the right steps to take advantage of the consolidation that will happen in every sector we are going to see a massive creative destruction a uh, lot of people may not be able to survive i think those people who are taking the right uh, steps today and have kept their balance sheet in the shape where they will be able to survive this crisis i think they will do well and we can discuss a little more in detail yeah sure so we we'll, uh, i'll get to that too so but the, the moot question i need would be that we are we have we are likely to see massive gdp contraction job losses and salary cuts are a reality um uh, india has largely been a consumption story right is that consumption story under challenge for a longer period of time or is it only for the next 3 to 6 months are you guys making a hypothesis you may well go wrong right who knows but what is the hypothesis you are making So I mean, there are many Indians. When you look at the consumption, there are there's a very small part of the population who consumes the way you would see people in the developed markets. There's a large part of the population where the consumption is even lower than some of the emerging markets. I think they are more closer to frontier markets, maybe sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the near-term outlook surely is very hazy. A longer-term outlook from two thousand dollars per capita, I think we have a long way to go. Relatively, just talking about the consumption, relatively, I think that. rural india seems to be in a better place uh, on a relative basis than the urban india uh, unless that these migrant laborers when they go back to their villages if the the uh, uh, if the disease spreads there then we'll have to wait and watch but otherwise i mean looking at the uh, better monsoon last year higher water levels i think good food prices harvesting has happened likely that we get a good monsoon uh, uh, this year as well the wealth effect has been positive because gold prices have done very well over the last few years Yes. and i think some of the things that we have done in last few years particularly on social security on road connectivity digital connectivity uh, banking connectivity electricity connectivity and all over a period of time there's a possibility that rural india does well and so bottom of the pyramid consumption even on the discretionary side there could be opportunities so again i mean we can talk about other aspects of consumption but i think india has a long way to go in the very near term high end consumption will surely take beating because people would like to save money and people would like to uh, consume less no doubt about it okay now uh, viewers remember for the viewers logged on to the bloomberg win uh, social media platforms this is the last question the session continues of course for the paf aif subscribers who have logged in via the listing but for the bloomberg win viewers this will be the last question and then we will of course uh, continue the session but without it being on bq but uh, let me uh, just a follow up to that then the larger picture because there's set of viewers who will be leaving right now the larger picture might be i mean I'm, please correct me if i'm wrong but what i'm trying to get from you or what i'm understanding from you in the last 15 20 minutes is that uh, if one ignores the hiccups over the next 6 months arguably the normalized picture will look a lot better and people shouldn't be too worried i think that's the message that uh, you probably working with so i wouldn't put that number whether it's 6 month or 12 months or 18 months i think the longer term picture will improve one because uh, big reforms happen when you have a crisis uh because they always have a lot of compulsion and the compulsion of this may lead to structural reforms from a global perspective both the cheap liquidity as well as the geopolitical crisis particularly between US and China or west of China can benefit india in various ways this could also be a big opportunity in sectors like healthcare in technology i think uh, the potential of data revolution in india has been underappreciated of course in last couple of weeks the kind of deals that we have heard <laughs> for one of the technology platform now it's getting discussed in global media is getting discussed in global boardrooms and i'm sure uh, whether the supply chain shifting to india whether the technological uh, whether the technology platforms in india with an another y2k movement uh, in healthcare or in in broad uh, digital technology all of these are positives one more positive for india relative to the previous crisis is i think the external side is on a, in a relatively better shape with yeah. 486 billion dollars of reserves 
getting invested at 1% or so, I think we can make better uses of that. The challenges at this point in time relative to earlier crisis is I think our fiscal capacity is very limited. Financial sector is not in the pink of, of, of its health. And I think if we are able to put, uh, I, I think if we are able to uh, do the right things on, on those two fronts, I'm sure I think India can not only uh, come out of this crisis uh, but I'm sure we'll be able to uh, take advantage of a lot of opportunities that can present themselves on the other side of this crisis. Okay. Lots more to talk about for the PMSAF viewers, but for the viewers in Bloomberg Queen, thank you so much for tuning into this broadcast. It was obviously lovely listening in to Navneet Muno. Thank you, Neeraj. Always a pleasure. Yeah, hi, Navneet. It's been great uh, hearing you. I think you have covered most of the aspects, but there are a lot of lot more questions that I would like to now, you know, take. So let's start about sectors, you know, at present, what are the, or what is the order of sectors in which if you have to kind of talk about your preference out of say, you know, financials, FMCG, IT, pharma, auto, infrastructure, if you have to order them as per your preference, how would that be? <laughs> So as I said, I think it's a lot more bottom up and market is smart. Wherever the damage is going to be the most in the near term, I mean, those sectors have taken a bigger beating. Wherever the near term uh, uh, damage in terms of growth outlook is less, I think they, they have got less impacted. Valuations are substantially higher. And you need to balance these two, where the market has the biggest uncertainty versus the valuations and, and of course, the, the other side of it. I think we are a lot more bottom up. I think in India, there are opportunities across sectors, maybe in, in our entire talk of last 20, 25 minutes, I may have touched upon some of the opportunities that can come our way. Even as I mentioned that while I feel uh, uh, we have been like cautious on the, on the financial side, I think the overall health of the financial sector, but there's another way to look at it. Because of the challenges, there is going to be consolidation. And the stronger players, I mean, strong in terms of their uh, uh, capital positions or the liquidity or the liability franchise, I think the more granular asset side, better risk management, better investment in digital capabilities. I think those will be in a position to grab a bigger market share as and when the growth returns. Near term uncertainty is very deep. That will lead to, that has already led to some bit of derating, maybe more derating uh, in the near term but there would be a bigger opportunity uh, from a long-term perspective. So I mean, that's how I will look at uh, all the sectors rather than a big top-down views on some of these sectors are, are, are right at the top. I mean, for example, I mean, we, 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 we played in our, our fund managers played the telecom sector very well because we could see the consolidation in the sector, pricing power coming back over a period of time, uh, policy environment becoming more favorable because so much of consolidation has happened and government would be worried about a monopoly or, or a duopoly. And then when we have seen that uh, playing out, we played through like one or two stocks there. And I think that's the case with like a lot of other sectors where there were clearly some challenges, but then the valuation comfort was there and you could see uh, some of the positive catalysts playing out. Right. Um, Kamal, yeah. Kamal, can I take a question to Navneet when he was we talking about teams? Yeah, please, please go uh, ahead. Thanks. Just one question. Uh, Navneet, uh, uh, there was a uh, survey done by Merrill Lynch Global uh, pre-COVID, then they had uh, interviewed or uh, taken the op opinion of 3,000 odd global firms. And all of them had said that even without COVID being there, they wanted to shift some of the supply chains out of China and Vietnam, uh, India, and I think uh, Indonesia were the three countries that stood out top of the line. Now, would you reckon and are you hearing in your conversations with corporates or global thought leaders or global companies that uh, companies are actively looking to do that? And if so, are there newer sectors like backend manufacturing, etc., which could actually become very big in India over the times to come? I think it has clearly been happening in a couple of sectors. Uh, electronics is a classic example where I think the manufacturing or whether you call it assembly has, has uh, gone up very substantially in India. Our chip imports have gone up versus the mobile phone imports have gone down very, very substantially. I mean, they are, they are, they are now bulk of that is getting manufactured in India. Once I think we, we ensure that through policy mechanism as well as investment by the private sector over a period of time, given that we have a large domestic demand also, we can create that entire ecosystem where even I think we, we 
more manufacture a lot many more components here we have seen in the chemicals clearly where companies are getting much larger orders from from global players so i think uh, india has clearly been gaining market share but we are still, still very small compared to like where china is i'm sure there would be opportunities in some of the other sectors over the last decade or or maybe two decades we have lost a lot of market share in textiles can we gain that back with some of the structural reform there is a possibility that can happen in some of the industrial goods as well i think again i mean india has a lot of opportunities on that side as well and of course healthcare and the uh, technology are two sectors where historically we had some strength i think if we invest right and i think if we are uh, uh, if we continue to provide the right kind of policy support i'm sure there's a lot of potential there right ami <clears throat> thanks so you know uh, there have been a lot of reports coming during month of march and till mid of april kind of projecting india's gdp getting into negative numbers and we kind of you know getting into recessionary mode in year in financially 21 so given your macro economic strengths i would like to understand from you what are your views in this regards do you see those reports changing their stance say after you know two months three months or you know you uh, you would think that that is exactly how the situation as worse as that is this we are in absolutely unprecedented situation these we are completely in uncharted waters before the month of march nobody could project that the world economy will have a recession which we have not seen in a generation or even in early march none of us could have visualized a situation where india would have a recession we have not seen in our lifetime but then as the situation is evolving it becoming increasingly clear that maybe we are going to have a recession but again i would say situation is so fluid and it's evolving if you get a vaccine earlier than expected and if situation starts normalizing who knows we may have a v shaped recovery we may have a w shape where we see a v shape and again there is a second wave or a third wave going by the history of spanish influenza we see a w shape we may have an l shape if this situation continues for some time one can project a, you know another scenario where it could be a u shaped and i have heard a new word recently which is i shaped maybe a vertical decline and it could be a vertical increase also i i, th- I think it, it in all our humility it's better that uh, we put all of these scenarios in front of us and then invest because i don't think any i mean one can get it right but that will be sheer luck rather than i would say a calculated uh, model where a model can show this is where the world will be in a year's time we can clearly visualize where the world will be in 5 years time i think with the kind of policy stimulus we have unleashed and also i think these are the kind of times when massive innovations happen where human ingenuity shows its best and i'm sure a 5 year later world will be in a better place than where we are today but in the next one year i think it's a very very difficult uh task to really put a number where india will be grow at 3% or 5 or 7 then beyond a point it loses its meaning in fact i'll keep it for some other time the way output is measured gdp growth i think you are going to see a very interesting debate over the next few years it's just a 100 year old concept i mean a little over 100 year how the gdp is calculated but i mean if i'm not going to drive to my office and i'm doing this event online or maybe we are not doing a physical event how do you really put that in a gdp we are actually not adding to gdp but actually we are creating the same value by having this conversation so and i can give you several other examples so beyond a point this minus 3 minus 5 and all will lose their meaning right so you know con- subsequent to this question there have been you know a lot of data points which have been just coming on social media and again through credible uh, players which have been saying that all the macro fundamentals otherwise are very conducive whether it be you know falling of crude oil price or you know the uh, reducing of interest rates or the possibility of inflation remaining low right because of all these fundamental uh, macro economic factors being very attractive and conducive india's actually economic you know uh, recovery should happen very fast but obviously the situation is uncertain so you have you know uh, discussed that part that you know obviously the situation is unprecedented so now practically if one has to create a portfolio of investing 100 rupees at this point of time you we know the the positives we know the unprecedented scenario would you and we know the uncertainty so how would you practically suggest that individual assume that individual is 50 years of age right and he you know you have to create a portfolio so what would be your suggestion would you want him to create sit on cash 
or would you want to want him to sit on 50% cash and invest 50% or you want him to invest 100% in debt and equity in some percentage so over to you so age is just one of the criteria but i'm sure each individual has a very different kind of risk appetite i think your ability to take what kind of drawdown equities can fall 40% in a month's time like march whether you can take that drawdown and what what is what is your uh, risk tolerance level i mean for what horizon there are various things but broadly i would say that valuations of course are lower than where they were in the month of february uh, markets have become cheaper no doubt about it but of course you have to take i mean you have to keep the near term uncertainty also in mind and there is huge amount of uncertainty in the very near term i think if you are a long term investor over the next few months are going to be a good time to keep uh, to keep putting the uh, money to work in on the on the uh, equity market as i mentioned earlier with the stimulus and the other measures there would be a creative destruction but i'm sure from a 3 5 year perspective the growth is likely to come back to normalcy and i'm sure uh, with a better valuations uh, you you'll make good returns so you go back in history and see when 3 year returns 5 year returns uh, are negative or where they are today if history is any guide the prospective returns have always been better for the next 3 and 5 years uh, on the bond side i've already discussed my views i think there is opportunity on the duration side at some point in time i'm sure even the credit markets will will, will also look attractive given the steepness in the curve you have a liquid fund or overnight which are delivering you 3% and then you have current yield of the credit fund and then what you can earn if you are in an ai format and buy some of the special situations and those high uh, double digit returns are very very attractive but of course it requires a very different kind of risk appetite different kind of time horizon right so what is the asset allocation so as, as i mentioned i think that will depend on each individual i mean i cannot generalize for all investors as i mentioned that if i mean if you don't have any money in equity now and you should be having some allocation i think this definitely a time where you should start putting some money to work uh, maybe you can stagger it over the next few months uh, while this uncertainty will continue but it's very difficult to pinpoint where the market is likely to bottom i mean markets always work like a pendulum they do exercise on both sides people become very greedy on the upside people become very fearful on the downside one news flow on us china conflict one news flow on let's say uh, if, the, if the numbers start rising in india got forbid one news flow on what happens globally or in india can really take markets 5 10 20% on on both sides but i think the better way would be to keep focusing on the long term and start putting money to work sure so the current pullback which we have seen especially in the us market everybody is talking saying that you know this is purely because of liquidity so in the month of march if markets were ruled by fear in april they have been ruled by liquidity and maybe till february they were being ruled by greed so these are the three factors so do you think fundamentals will catch up over say the next couple of quarters or we'll see you know greed fear and liquidity kind of you know creating the momentum in the market so us is slightly unique and just to repeat the point that i discussed with neeraj earlier that i think also to do with the composition of the market the so called fang stocks or you call it some people call it the uh, uh, mafia ma mafia or mafia or whatever you are the microsoft apple uh, amazon alphabet uh, facebook i mean uh, uh, and, and and those kind of stocks which have done very well because of i mean the world is moving more towards e-commerce world is using the technology the online technology a lot more and they have been a beneficiary of it and of course the sheer stimulus that has been provided and put yourself in a trader shoes uh, when you have central banks ready with unlimited amount of of uh, check i mean unlimited amount to write on a check for any kind of asset class i mean you wouldn't go and short the market regardless of where the valuations are i think the reality will unfold over the next few months two quarters what kind of economic damage and the impact on corporate profitability it has on a wider basis also beyond a point at some point in time global investors will have to keep in mind the longer term implications of rates at zero or the negative yields uh, on 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 the uh, on the health of financial system over a longer period of time on whether it can unleash some kind of inflationary pressures over a longer period of time and, and so on and so forth so i think these are early days as i mentioned that i think the sheer stimulus has also been very forceful and particularly in us uh, uss case i think the kind of companies they have in the index your view is you know balanced uh, i am unable to you know 
ultimately gauge right so are you more cautious or you think markets is throwing great opportunity okay let me put it this way at, at this point in time given the uncertainties in the very near term as one of my fund manager put it very nicely how do you feel i feel anxiously excited anxious for the reasons that nobody really knows how situation is going to pan out in next 6 month or or 12 months i wouldn't like to really put a put a large bet on that that okay this is how a vaccine is going to come then the health crisis will be over this much of a stimulus economy will come back come back in this shape nobody really knows now i wear another shoes that we are a relative investor for example you have already allocated money to us on equity are we taking a large cash call no we are not taking a large cash call what we are doing is trying to uh, trying to look for a higher margin of safety when we are buying a stock we are not looking at large thematic sector calls we are looking at each company by company businesses by businesses which is the management which will use this as an opportunity not only to survive but to actually consolidate and come out stronger i think on a bottom up basis there are going to be if i can use the word and those are stronger word once in a lifetime opportunity to buy some outstanding quality businesses at reasonable valuations till two months back i think great businesses were not available at good valuations because there was a lot of demand for it now you are seeing foreign investors selling you have seen domestic flows coming down there are going to be very interesting opportunities if you have time on your side if you have the time on your side if you have the patience to hold it for longer term there are going to be very exciting opportunities so i'm sounding anxious on one side but i'm sounding very excited on the other side right so just to you know just i would like you to correct you know you are you seeing opportunities already available or you're seeing opportunities coming over absolutely time? even already available because as i said that businesses that will get more negatively impacted in the in the near term now okay i mean don't don't get me wrong so let's say i give you a good example travel and tourism where everybody is very concerned that in the very near term this is a sector which will really take the brunt of the health crisis people are not going to travel the way they were traveling two months back now if i take a five year view will there not be any events will there won't be travel will people not travel for leisure will people not travel for business at all will this remain like this not really i mean is it that nobody is going to have holidays and vacation people will only work from home and people will only consume netflix at home not really world will come back to a lot of normalcy where we were all the youtube has only increased the number of live concerts i'm just giving an indication of how to look at look at a sector or or a stock now those stocks have taken a big beating but within those sectors there would be few companies which we believe have the balance sheet have the ability to survive this crisis and they will do well now i'm not saying that i'll only look at sectors or stocks which are going to get less impacted in the near term i'm saying on the contrary some of the sectors which are going to be the worst impacted in the in the near term i have no idea whether a year later people will go and, and how the hotel industry will look like but where there is a future for hotel industry yes whether there could be some companies who will not only survive this crisis and come out stronger yes and bet on that sure so you know i understand that you know we should be betting on quality whether it be large cap or it be mid cap bottom up approach but if we stick to quality and invest for long term these are i think great times right so <clears throat> how how about what is your i can turn that word quality into like with a higher margin of safety that there is lesser financial leverage and lesser operating leverage where the ability of the management to survive this period is greater right so somehow you know uh, investors invest on emotions also they would they would have invested in mutual funds they would have invested in pmss but at the same time you know all equity investors have some of the stocks that they have bought on their own now some of those stocks which have been bought themselves would be towards you know stocks like ntpc ongc right so, so you know maybe through ipo they would have invested into indian railways so this is these are the psu stocks so psu stocks are not favored of markets for last 2 3 years what are your views do you see you know because the the private sector is definitely getting hurt and valuations there are higher right do you see that the tide turning towards psu stocks so we also had lesser weight towards them for variety of reasons one is that all of these stocks uh, are basically are are a cyclical plays i mean they are a uh, lot more related with the uh, investment cycle then the they i mean you don't have the psus in the consumer space or or in the uh, in the it space or healthcare space you have more uh, play on the on the uh, investment cycle and also for variety of reasons 
some of these stocks have been under pressure over the last couple of years. But I think uh, the valuations have really turned attractive. Even on a relative basis, I think some of them offer a very high dividend yield now. Uh, their ability to survive, I mean, the word that I've been using a couple of times, resilience is a lot more because of the sovereign backing. I think their ability to raise capital or, or, or raise liquidity or raise that is much greater. Some of these businesses, when you compare them with the replacement value today, I think they are really looking attractive. Maybe I think that there could be uh, some opportunities in that space as well. And as I think this entire government's plan for vocal for local or you know the, the promoting the local manufacturing uh, more on the defense side or in, even some of the other sectors i think some of these stocks could be a beneficiary right so you know <clears throat> this uh, this is the last question that you know i would like to ask and this question is a fundamental question you represent the industry and you're one of the thought leaders i had asked this question from nilesh also so uh, you know we have seen last 10 years where markets uh, from peak to peak have kind of given 2x return. So from 20,000, we have gone to 40,000, right? So over 10 year period, this is a CAGR of hardly five, five and a half percent. And during this 10 year period, at the same time, dollar has also strengthened. So from the perspective of say FIIs or NRI investors, we have hardly, you know, Indian equity markets have hardly given any return, but we keep saying that time in the market is more important than timing the market. So people who have yeah. remained investors for 10 years, you know, they have fairly given a good amount of time. So we, we obviously do not expect investors to start timing the market as a, uh, you know, moral, but, but do, would you support the fact that at least fund managers should try to time the market, given the fact that over the last 10 year period, we saw valuations coming down, valuations going up, you know, we were at all time highs in terms of valuations three, four months ago, but none of the fund managers, in fact, even in the balance funds, they had taken cash calls. So, you know, you, we consider you as thought leaders and, you know, how would you uh, like industry to kind of behave in next 10 years? From, uh, what are your views in this regards? No, that's a very interesting question. And I'll, 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 I'll give you a couple of perspectives on that. Number one, that when you look at that 10 years, point to point, one can always paint a picture differently depending on what is the starting point you take. You take January 2008, 21,000 cents X, and then you have a different number. You take October 2008 or a March 2009, 8,000 index, it's a very different picture. And that's why I think we always suggest that one should keep doing, it's an SIP or, or remaining very disciplined that you keep investing at all levels and then allow that the, uh, the law of average to work in your favor. The other point should we be do the, we should we do the market timing. See, there are asset allocators and there are asset managers. If somebody has given me a mandate to put money in a large cap fund or in a mid cap fund or a small cap fund or a multi cap fund or a flexi cap fund, so on and so forth, I think the person has already done the asset allocation. It's not our job to again put another overlay of, of doing another asset allocation. Their job should be uh, to outperform the relative, uh, the, the relevant benchmark as well as the relevant peer set. That's very, very critical. The third aspect of it, some investor could expect us to do that asset allocation. And for that, we have variety of products, right from an equity hybrid to a debt hybrid to let's say uh, the kind of uh, some of the other asset allocation product, we have dynamic asset allocation, we have a multi-asset allocation fund where we invest in fixed income, equity, as well as in gold, I mean, minimum 10% in each one of them. And then we take a technical call on the remaining 70%. There's a dynamic asset allocation where we go from zero to hundred percent in equity, cash or bond. So there are different kinds of product, but in the core equity or core bond product, my view has always been to stick to the mandate that the investor has given you. If the investor has asked you to take credit risk, take credit risk. If the investor has asked you to take duration risk, take duration risk. If has asked you to buy large caps, then buy large cap. If has asked you to buy gold, then buy gold. And don't try to put another overlay of asset allocation view superimposing on what the investor's view has already been. But you know, the interesting aspect that you very rightly mentioned about a 10 year period where let's say, if you think from a dollar return perspective and foreign investors may not have made good amount of money relative to a US market and some of the other markets. But if history is any guide, this could also be that point where if you have underperformed for 10 years, then maybe the next 10 years are good. And I give you the uh, perspective from let's say 92 to 2002. So index moved up from, Sensex moved up from 1000 to 4000 in year, year and half time between 91 and 92. And then for 10 years, it was consolidating. 
it fell to 2000 it went to 3000 or so 2000 and then it went up to 6000 in 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 february 2000 and then for but for 10 years it remained in a very very narrow range and then over the next 5 years sensex went from 3000 to 21000 between march or april 2003 to jan 2008 so who knows i mean this could be that tipping point where the next 10 years I think the market again outperforms the economic growth. Last 10 years, if you put the economic growth versus the market return, I think it's a different picture. Maybe the 10 year markets will, will catch up with that. And of course, the economic growth has also been, I think, relatively lower than what one would have expected. And particularly in India's case, profit growth actually has been much, much lower than what anybody would, would have projected five or seven years back. I think our profit growth turned out to be like last seven or eight years, year after year, and the number of excuses keep changing. Maybe the commodity price fall, inventory losses for oil companies, something happened in like banks because of the NPA, something happened in telecom sector, something, or the industrial cycle has got delayed, something or the other. But for seven or eight years, you start the year with a 20% growth expectations and profit, and you end the year in low single digit. I'm sure another year is going like this, it's so unfortunate. But I'm sure over a period of time it will change because over a 25 year period, India has shown our ability to convert nominal GDP growth into that corporate profit growth also. It hasn't happened in the last seven, eight years, but I'm sure next seven or eight could be different, hopefully. Right. So hopefully is the word at which we will end. <laughs> right. So, you know, uh, as a crux, I would just summarize by saying that, you know, one should take care of one's asset allocation very diligently. We should not expect fund managers to uh, do the taking of cash calls or doing asset allocation. They are supposed to stick to the mandate. And these are maybe one of the best times, uh, one of the you know uh, once in a decade kind of an opportunity for investors to invest into equity markets. Invest in a staggered manner, invest in quality, do a bottom-up approach and keep up cautiously optimistic view, which is what PMSAI world has been conveying in most of our reports. Thank you, Namdeez. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neeraj. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Namdeez. Lovely listening to you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks, Kamal. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.